Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Deadhead Cannabis Show. Jim Marty reporting from a clear blue sky, warm 60-degree day here in December in Denver. Well, boy, Jim, uh, it can't get much better than that. This is Larry Michigan of the Hoban Law Group reporting from Chicago, where it is uh, dark and cold. So, um, you know, daylight savings time going away has hit us hard. We get these early nights, and by the time I get outside to the parking lot, it's chilly. You got to move quick around here. But otherwise, all is good. And uh, we roll into another week of uh, marijuana and the Grateful Dead and uh, other things that we like to talk about. And right off the bat, Jim, I'll tell you, there's nothing to talk about in Illinois. And I think we're just going to drop Illinois from our discussion for a while unless we want to talk about an example of how a, a state which had such a promising future has really bollocked things up. And it's just going to be a mess sitting down and going through things with my clients now and trying to figure out what's going to be required before licenses are going to be awarded in this first round. Uh, it's just amazing. But we're probably not going to see anything before next summer. Uh, that's very disappointing. And especially for the people who are getting ready to go in round two, which was supposed to be getting started by right after the first of the year. And now that's been delayed indefinitely until they get round one worked out. So that's all there is to say about Illinois. Hopefully they will get it worked out soon. and. Uh, uh, we'll get to move forward with that. Um, otherwise, things around here are uh, pretty much normal and status quo. What's going on out in Denver? Oh, um, things are good out here. Our cannabis industry is an essential industry, but we feel very, very bad for the bars and restaurants. I was driving around Denver today, and it's just amazing how many bars and restaurants there are in Denver. I mean, there's several on every single block on the streets I drive on, and um, it's like tent city. So they've set up tents with heaters, because uh, even though we get warm afternoons all winter here in Colorado, um, with that clear blue sky, the temperature drops 30, 40 degrees at night, down into the 30s and 20s. So, um, but I'll be going to um, my favorite steakhouse tonight, uh, Elway's, after John Elway, the football player, having dinner with some colleagues. And uh, we'll be sitting outside in a tent with a heater. So we'll see how that goes. Um, well, once you take a bite out of that Pittsburgh style steak, I'm sure you'll be just fine. Yep. So, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing my, my friends over at Elway's tonight. And um, excellent. You know, musically, obviously, very, very quiet. But politically, things are moving. Um, Arizona will be allowing the current medical cannabis license holders to apply. For adult use starting, I believe, at the end of January. Very nice. I like that. Had the election in November. and They're getting started right away, not wasting any time. Uh, I was in Massachusetts last week, and um, it could have knocked me over with a feather. I went into a dispensary, and they had $30 Ace. Really? Holy cow. I know. And actually, the next day, someone sent me an article that Ace are dropping all over Massachusetts as more producers come online. So the $60 eighth has been dropping now to about 45 And then this was a special deal that I just happened to catch at $30 a gram. But uh, vape pen cartridges were still 50 I got a vape pen cartridge. I bought a few samples because um, I was doing some due diligence for a Massachusetts client. Well, you know, I, I, I always admire the fact that when you go on these business trips of yours, you're, you're always, uh, you know, jetting off to exotic locations and fun places. Um, sometimes you even make your way down into, into Florida. Uh, I went out to visit a, a client site the other day. It was in lovely Rockford, Illinois. And I got to drive about an hour and 20 minutes uh, due west of the city of Chicago. Uh, luckily, it was a nice day. So for driving, it, it went very well. And a uh, funny thing about Rockford, Illinois, that I learned when I got out there, uh, that it is the place that has been selected as the geographic location in the United States that is best suited for hemp cultivation, huh. uh, taking into account soil conditions, weather conditions, transportation access, big cities nearby, you know, all the different things that would go in to creating a market. And, and Rockford, Illinois came out on top. Um, and I've got a client out there that's uh, involved in hemp. They're involved in CBG. Uh, and I got to sample a little CBG, which I found uh, very impressive. Um, have you have you uh, ventured into the CBG world yet, Jim? Yes. Yeah, we have a extraction company in Fort Collins who is uh, doing quite a bit with um, not just CBG, but Delta 8 and Delta 9. 
and um, sure, I have gotten some sample vape pens, and the um, it was interesting. I did take it to my trip to Florida where we had a an all day boat ride. This boat we were on could go ninety miles an hour and holds like twenty people, and um, that's amazing. We made it from Key West to Miami in one day by water, going seventy the whole way. <clears throat> but anyway, I was sharing my uh, Delta Nine vape pen around the boat and um well, the people were coming up to say that oh, i just love that i just love that and can you still have this vape pen? Can I make another hit on that vape pen so uh yeah i field tested it on my trip to key west yeah excellent and yeah the cannabigerol uh, i actually got it in flower form which uh uh i was you know fascinated by and um i uh, have, have tried it out a little bit and have found it to be uh you know pretty good in terms of um you know overall positive uh benefits helps calm the stomach things like that yep and uh but it was it was just nice to get out you know on site to a, a cultivation somewhere uh you know get involved and in you know just walk through it all and soak it all up a little bit and talk to the guys who are running it and you know kind of get a sense for where they're at and what they want to do and you know that's what the industry is all about and that's the nice part about what you and i do is that there's a, a real uh you know, encouragement and excitement by the clients. They want us to come out. They want us to see what they're doing, you know, in part because they want us to see, yes, they're complying and doing it all right. But also, you know, these guys in their own way are artists too. And they like to, you know, show off the work that they're doing. And I'm only too happy to go out there and, and check it out for them. Yeah, I was at a small cultivation today here in Denver. Um, our listeners may not be aware, but there's a certain protocol you follow when you do a site visit to a cultivation facility and that is you only go to one in a day because you could pick up contaminants and spread those to the next place you visit so whenever i visit Correct. a site visit i was saying by the way you're my only site visit today just give a little peace of mind everybody knows and then that way they know that you know and then they talk to you entirely differently which is much nicer yep well um staying on politics for a little bit before we switch to music is um yes so we had an act of Congress, uh, I believe, in um, December or the end of November. I believe it's called the Moore Act. Correct. That's the uh, Marijuana Opportunity Reinvestment and Expungement Act of 2020. And as the uh, attorney on the program here, I'm going to defer to you to explain some of it. One thing that caught my eye, and again, I've just glanced at the headlines, that it is a decriminalization Act, not a legalization act. Well, that's true. And, you know, I, I don't want to say that, uh, that it takes a lawyer to understand it, but it kind of takes a lawyer to understand it because they're playing kind of loose and fast with the terms. And, and what I mean by that is uh, this is a, a, a the, the Marijuana Opportunity Reinvestment and Expungement Act. Uh which was legislation passing it. And what it does significantly is it removes marijuana from the Controlled Substances Act, thereby decriminalizing the substance at the federal level and enabling states to set their own policies, not unlike what was happened, what happened with industrial hemp. In other words, we would basic this would basically be the same thing where the federal government would come back and the federal government would say, that uh, at this point in time, uh, we're no longer taking the position that marijuana is illegal on a federal basis. It, it no longer is. States, it's up to you. Whatever you'd like to do, basically go ahead and do it. Um, and it does set up, uh, you know, some very interesting possibilities uh, in terms of what that can mean um, for everyone in this industry, as well as, you know, Jim, you and I have considered what it might mean for uh, a big industry and whether that might encourage them to come walking through the door. Uh, but basically, um, it, it's after that, there's really nothing more for the federal government to do, right? I mean, once they've decriminalized it um, and they've said it's up to the states, then they don't really have anything except for, as we can talk about later, because this will be the, you know, the, the tail end of it. But the unfortunate part that has to be talked about is just like with hemp, that all of the agencies will now get regulatory jurisdiction over marijuana, whereas before they didn't because it was a Schedule One, so it was a matter of law enforcement and criminal enforcement and had nothing to do with regulators. Now the regulators are going to come flooding in. But in the meantime, 
this is not insignificant. Um, in fact, it's more than that. It's this is really what many, many people uh, have been looking for a signal from the federal government that it is no longer going to try to step in and punish people uh, for engaging in uh, appropriate use of marijuana and other cannabis products. Um, it's exciting. Uh, you know, regardless of what it ultimately does to the industry, it's exciting uh, because for those people who are on an individual basis who want to stay in the industry, we can now confidently tell them you don't have to worry about the federal government anymore. And for big business that wants to make its way in the door, they can do so too. And, you know, we'll have to see whether that can be an overall plus or minus. But, and this is a big but, Jim, we can't get too far ahead of ourselves. And the reason we can't get too far ahead of ourselves is because as I remember from schoolhouse rock days, and they you know, taught us how bills pass on Capitol Hill, um, it takes two to tango, and we still need the Senate to approve the MORE Act or some version of the MORE Act that it can then send back to the House for its approval again. However, in order for that to happen, it has to go through committee, and then it has to come out onto the floor for a vote. And Under the current administration, uh, the Republican-controlled Senate has not demonstrated any real interest in moving uh, any litigation, really, for excuse me, any legislation from the House that's that they see as a source of Democratic um, product. Now, let me be very clear that when I'm saying this, it's not necessarily to sit there and slam the Republicans, as we've seen. The Republicans, in fact. Uh, are as supportive of marijuana policy as are the Democrats, which we noticed when we took a look at some of these very conservative states uh, that elected a clean slate of Republican uh, legislators but had no problem passing uh, the various cannabis and legalized marijuana statutes that were on their um, that were on their ballots. I think this is more the standard type of party politics that whichever party is in power is less inclined to move along legislation proposed by the party that's out of power. Um, And it could just as easily be happening the other way. Uh, In this instance, uh, we have uh, Mitch McConnell there, but I guess at least for people who uh, think that Mitch McConnell won't be inclined to move this legislation along, the two Georgia elections coming up, really become the center of the cannabis universe uh, because if Democrats are elected in both of them and the Democrats take control of the Senate, it doesn't guarantee either that, that, that uh, Chuck Schumer, whoever, you know, would take over for Mitch McConnell would necessarily bring the matter up, but they might. And, you know, it would really be nice, you know, to put all of that behind us and just let the full Senate vote on it because I think, and I think you agree that if the Senate votes on it, it's going to pass. Yeah. Yeah, and whether it's Trump or Biden, I think either one would, would sign it into law. But my question is, absolutely, the MORE Act, assuming that it passed, which, as you pointed out, is a big step forward that hasn't been happened yet, um, would that allow for cross-state border distribution? Um, don't know. And to tell you the truth, I, I have not read the bill deeply enough to understand that. Uh, it's an excellent point, and it's really something that uh, – needs to be focused on as well because um you know certainly we know for hemp that's exactly what they did and they went ahead and they opened up the market for it uh the cross state uh market for it and that was uh, uh when they when the government comes out and says that no state may interfere with the interstate uh transportation of the bill uh that's not insignificant and um it would be nice if they did it uh my suspicion is is that the states themselves are not going to be very uh, interested in doing that. And I think that the reason they're not going to be very interested in doing that is is because, you know, as you and I have talked about and we've long noted, the state of California right now produces the most amount of marijuana of any state in the country so much that three-fifths of its annual crop is sold outside of the state. Now, you know, I think most people would say that if they have an easy black market option to get their hands on some really good California grass uh, at a reasonable price, that's a tempting uh, option to consider instead of going and supporting your local dispensary and your local cultivators. Yes. So, you know, that th- there may be a bit of protectionism involved by states to say, hey, look, we don't want 
California or Colorado or Hawaii or, you know, any of the, you know, hip cool states that people you know, automatically assume are states that produce the very best, you know, here in Illinois, we want you to buy from Illinois. And I, I suspect that a state will have an opportunity to take that position if they want. You know, we've already seen on the hemp side, it does create a little bit of difficulty um, because even though the federal government has said that, you know, no state may interfere with the interstate transportation, in fact, some states have and regularly do interfere with the interstate transportation. And they've taken the position that when you come across our state borders, you're subject to our state laws. And, you know, ultimately, whether they're right or wrong is going to require, you know, somebody who's really willing to spend a lot of money and fight the thing as far as it has to be fought fought to get that kind of an answer. So I'm not sure what's going to happen with that. Nobody knows, but even if you take a conservative Republican like Mitch McConnell, um, he still has a good read for what's going on around the country. And I don't think there's any um, motion or movement in any state to continue marijuana prohibition. I, I think that's game over. And now it's really about yep. clean it, how you clean it up. Yeah, I, I think that that's probably true. You know, and and again, you know, the type of politics I'm talking about here, of course, is just, you know, pre all of this, you know, we can't agree on what day of the week it is. But, you know, you go back in history and one party's always looking to try and get credit, uh, you know, for other types of opportunities or to deny, to, not, to deny other party credit for different types of opportunities. And I think that sometimes, you know, that type of gamesmanship in the Senate uh, can get in the way of useful legislation. And, you know, I would like to think that something like this that has such universal support uh, should be impervious to that type of thing. But rules are rules. And as long as the Republicans control the Senate, Mitch McConnell is well within his rights, you know, to make the determinations that he makes as the president of the Senate. And, you know, as my grandfather would say, if you don't like it, vote him out of office. <laughs> and they tried and they lost that. So he's, he's not going anywhere. Right, right. So um, anyway, that's kind of paints the political landscape for this week. Uh, we'll have obviously a lot more to talk about as 2021 approaches. And hopefully in 2021, we'll be back to public gatherings, bars and restaurants and, and concerts. The vaccine is getting distributed in other countries. It should be approved for distribution here. I believe tomorrow the FDA is set to make a decision. Hopefully it will be the end of the coronavirus, but we shall see. Yes, um, that would be nice. Attention Cannabis Podcast listeners. You can now listen to your favorite cannabis podcast ad-free with the MJ Bulls mobile app. Just download the free MJ Bulls mobile app to your smartphone to start enjoying cannabis podcasts with no commercials. Go to Apple Apps or Google Play to get the MJ Bulls cannabis podcast app today. Obviously not much going on in the world of music other than we had a significant passing away of a, of a great musician this week. Well, Howard Wales, Jim, was, uh, what was he, 77 years old, and uh, he died, passed away on December 7th, Pearl Harbor Day, and, and Howard was a, a, a lifer in the music industry, primarily a session player, um, played with any number of musical acts. I think uh, uh, he played with Ronnie Hawkins for a while, Freddie King, um, other musicians of that era. Uh, but he also had a real background in rock and R and B and all of that. Uh, in the early seventies, he made his way to the matrix nightclub in San Francisco, which was a well-known alternative music spot, which also happened to be frequented by a young Jerry Garcia. And so ultimately Howard and Jerry started playing together. They were joined up by two guys who became regulars of the Jerry Garcia band, John Kahn, the bassist and Bill Vitt on drums. And around 71, I believe, they put out an album called Hooter Roll. It's, it's an uh, uh, all-musical album, uh, mostly all composed by Howard Wales, uh, which I found interesting. I, I always assumed that it was Jerry's music, and he brought Howard in to play it with him. But in fact, it was the opposite. It was music uh, primarily composed by Howard, and uh, that, that he brought Jerry and the others in to play on. And then a few years later, they came out with a... Uh, Another one, which was like the the 
the unreleased tapes from the recording session of the album that was then subsequent released as well. I think it's called Side Trips Volume 1. And what's really interesting about it, it, it to me, it really showed the... Um, you know, the wide range of Jerry's playing abilities. This, this does not come across as regular Grateful Dead music. Um, you know, you can, you can pick up some Jerry mannerisms in there, uh, but this is much more free form kind of jazz. And it's really, really incredible to hear. I call it dead dinner music because it, when I want, we have company over for dinner and I want to put on some music and I'm looking for something with Jerry in it that I can play that people won't object to as just another Grateful Dead concert. I throw on Hooter Roll and everybody loves it. And then at the end, I tell them that that was Garcia and uh, people really get a kick out of it. Um, but Howard was, he was, he was really something. And I, I, I read a story, Jim, uh, that had an interview with Bill Kreutzman who talked about when Howard came uh, and actually had a tryout with the dead to step in and be their keyboard player. And he said that he was too intense. Uh, Kreutzman said that Howard was too intense even for the Grateful Dead and that, uh, you know, while some of his music fit in very, very nicely with what they were doing, uh, they thought that his his temperament and his personality was a little over the top even for them at the time, uh, which is really saying a lot when you're talking about the 19, uh, the Grateful Dead circa 1968 to 1970. Um, but Howard just kind of went on and, and you know, had a, uh, a, a musical career, again, primarily as a session musician and uh, did collaborations with various artists and it's, you know, it, it's really a shame, uh, that he's gone. It's another death in the dead universe. Uh, you know, it seems like we've had a few of them this year. Certainly Robert Hunter's death was, uh, uh, one that was difficult and, you know, prior to him, John Perry Barlow. And, uh, I guess that's just what happens in the dead universe, right? As, as we all grow older, they grow older. And uh, one by one, these legends all drop. But uh, it's funny you mentioned your college dormitory because that's the first place I heard this album was in my college dormitory, although it was already in the early 1980s by that point. This was a, you know, quote unquote, you know, uh, classic album by that point. Um, but it was fun to listen to. And it, it was part of my trip uh, in discovering the Grateful Dead and, uh, and everything that, uh, you know, Jerry did as well. So it was nice. Uh, one, one last note you can, uh, I'm remembering now because we had talked about American Beauty and its 50th anniversary. Uh, Wales chipped in on uh, organ, I, organ and piano on that album. I think he plays on Truckin' and Broke Down. And I want to say maybe Candyman as well. Mm. Um, I, I remember he played on a few of them. Um, you know, and they have David Grisman on that album. American Beauty is just such an amazing album, such a compilation of tremendous, tremendous musicians. Mm. And, you know, it's moments like this that really makes us take a step back and think about that kind of stuff. Yes. And um, actually, I did think of another music-related story to share. Um, so <clears throat> Phil Collins, right, of um, – Genesis. Um, he has a daughter named Lily Collins, and she's 32 years old, and she's been an actress since she was two years old. She was in commercials starting at the age of two, and she is starring okay. in a wonderful new TV series. I believe it's on Netflix called Lily in Paris, and especially for the um, millennial generation, it's a real kick. It's a real cultural kick. To Oh, and she's from Chicago in the show. And they drop her into Paris for a year to work at, to bring um, her American ideas to a Paris perfume company. And it's all about the uh, social conflict between a young American and uh, staged um, dyed in the wool Parisians who are not too fond of hearing about new American ideas. So I highly recommend that for our listeners. And Lily, uh, Collins is just a, a great, great actress. Very nice. Um, one other musical note that I do want to add um, is a new musical. Well, they're really not a new musical band, but for me, they're a new musical band and one that I've uh, some of my friends have told me about. And I've just finally started listening to them a little bit. And when I say my friends, I mean my good buddy, Alex Wellens, who was a guest on our show not too long ago. And uh, is usually the guy who steers us all into uh, these new musicians and, and the music that they're cranking out. And Jim, this is a band called, I'm not going to pronounce it right, if it's Turquoise or Turquoise, T-U-R-K-U-A-Z. They're an amalgamation of about eight or nine or ten people up on stage, all wearing different color outfits and playing 
guitars and some of the men are wearing boas and some of the women are wearing bow boas and they're everybody's up there just having a great time um and it was a show that they had done previously uh, from the brooklyn bowl obviously pre-pandemic because the the brooklyn bowl was packed with a crowd um and the, the funny thing about them is is I, I i think they're just not quite on the full national radar yet but the irony is is that without the pandemic they certainly would have been on the uh, national radar by now because uh they were supposed to be touring this summer and their tour this summer was going to include uh jerry harrison formerly of the talking heads and adrian blue uh, who also did some time with the talking heads and the tom tom club which was the Talking Heads percussionists, if you will, going off on their own little side run. Uh, Adrian also played with King Crimson, one of my favorite heavy rock bands, uh, and others. Um, and so uh, um, Tur Turquoise and Jerry Harrison and the Talking Heads were going to perform the entire Talking Heads Stop Making Sense live album. Um, and we were, my wife and I and a whole group of our friends were all prepared to travel out to one of the summer festivals primarily just to see them do that. Uh, but unfortunately, it did not happen. Um, but nevertheless, uh, this was a great show we saw. And then instead, they wound up covering um, The Last Waltz. And so we got to hear a whole number of great uh, band tunes. But also, they played uh, a lot of the tunes that the guests at The Last Waltz played. So we heard some of the Dylan stuff and, uh, and other stuff, some of the Dr. John tunes. And it was really, really a lot of fun. I really recommend Turquoise to people. Uh, who are looking for somebody new to listen to. They jam really well and they they sound good and they cover lots of good stuff. But that's given me an idea, Jim, and uh, something we can throw out to our listeners that you and I should work on for the next week or so as a homework assignment is we should each make a list of our five or ten favorite live rock and roll albums that are not dead fish jam band necessarily related um you know I, I can't pick dicks picks one through ten let's say um mm -hmm. uh you know whether whether live dead is, is 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 open for being picked we can we can leave that to interpretation but there's so many guys i just thought of this you know because of stop making sense which is certainly one of my favorite live albums and the fact that these guys were going to go out and cover it you know with actual musicians from the band and then uh with this other band turquoise was just really promised to be uh, 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 something very exciting this summer. But I, I'd like to see uh, uh, how close you and I get to listing some of the same albums for favorite live non dead musical albums. That's very good. That's a really good way to end the um, year of 2020. And as I said, hopefully we'll have live music <clears throat> at large venues again in 2021. Um, one note in closing, um, this show, the deadhead cannabis show is really getting some traction. Uh, when I go around the country, people are coming up to me, or I, I do a lot of speaking. This year it's been mostly on Zoom video calls. And uh, at question and answer time, I'll, people will make comments that how much they enjoy the Deadhead Cannabis show. So I think this show is starting to get some good traction. Well, I certainly hope so. It's a lot of fun for us. And, you know, to tell you the truth, once you and I start talking, I kind of forget for a minute that, uh, uh, you know, there's a whole audience out there. And I'm just enjoying the fact that we get to sit around and talk about marijuana and the Grateful Dead for an hour. Yep. All right. Well, I'm going to sign out here. Um, this is Jim Marty saying goodbye from Denver, Colorado. Larry? Jim, always a pleasure. Have a great week out there. I hope you guys uh, keep having nice weather and that you don't get too cold at night. Uh, enjoy the barn. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we'll make do here in Illinois as we always do. Uh, so to all of our listeners, uh, listen to the Grateful Dead. Have a great week. Enjoy your marijuana responsibly, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, everyone. Have a good week. Thank you.